I think some stragglers might be coming in, uh, but uh, but we should get started. Uh, it's it's five after ten. We've we've all you know politely waited for the for the latecomers to show up, um, which included me. Just for the record, uh, uh, I was chatting with Tyler upstairs, the gentleman who greeted you at the door. Very nice man, a bookseller, no less. He used to work at City Lights Books. He's a good guy. You know Tyler. You guys know Tyler, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, anyway, welcome to uh, London Writers Today 1. There'll be uh, number two tomorrow, the sequel, inferior to this panel, of course, uh, but the budget's bigger, uh, but the waste is greater. Um, and uh, thank you, too, I, I should say, for coming so, uh, so er well, relatively speaking. I mean, this is an arts and culture crop <laughs> relatively early, so thank you very much. Um, like, Vanessa's still sleeping at the house, I think, right now, so... Uh, so, so I had to get up and brush my teeth and have a shower and make the boys breakfast and shuffle out of the house with my umbrella and walk to the museum. So, so I'm here, and so are you. So thank you very much. This is lovely. Uh, so, um, so, <laughs> so today we have a panel. This is, this, is, this is London Writers Today. And so we have a fantastic panel of Amelia, Jenna, Gabrielle, and Kevin. Um, these folks are all fantastic. And today we're gonna talk about, so the theme of words this year is reimagining regionalism. And regionalism is a subject that I'm really fascinated with. Uh, and so um, I'm really excited just to go like straight into that subject. Um, we had to sort of dance around it last year uh, because it's one of those things that not everybody likes to talk about. Not because it's bad or anything, but just, you know, like we've talked about it too much, you know, shouldn't we talk, be talking about something else, something more interesting, something new, but we're reimagining it this year. And so I'm hoping to have a discussion with these fine folks about how London, Ontario plays into their work. Do they like it? Do they hate it? Do they like it and hate it? Because that's an entirely possible thing too. Um, so, uh, and we're gonna hear from uh, each of you, you've all brought stuff to read, am I right? Yeah, we're gonna hear from each of you. Jenna, maybe not. We're gonna hear from. Yeah, no, I am. Yeah, okay. I, I, I got it okay. together. Excellent. <laughs> um, but we should start off with some introductions. How about uh, just a quick introduction from each of you to, to say hello to the audience, who you are, why you're here, and why you're the potentially uh, greatest writer in the world. How's that? <laughs> Amelia, would you like to start? <laughs> hello. Can everyone hear me? Yeah. Uh, my name is Amelia Doze. I write a book about every other year in a completely different way. My first book was a biography. Uh, I've written some, I'm writing a self-help book right now, I've written a children's book. So thanks for having me. Um, I'm Jenna Rose Sands. Um, I write ragey zines about indigenous issues. And I'm here because they asked me to. <laughs> and yeah, thank you. Uh, I'm Gabrielle Drolet. I work as Western student writer in residence, which I think is why I was invited. Um, <laughs> also, because I'm great. I, uh, I do a lot of poetry, and I also work as a journalist. So I've written for the Toronto Star, Globe and Mail, and Vice, among other places. And uh, yeah, yeah, I'm here. Cool. Um, my name's Kevin. Um, I'm a poet and an actor, and... Uh, I don't know why I'm here. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Sorry, Jake. Yeah, no. We'll figure that out. We'll tease that out <laughs> as, the, as the panel goes. Um, we're really selling it. Yeah. yeah. We'll get there. We'll get there. Yeah, we're not Trust awake. We'll get there. Um, so, um, welcome. Um, I'm going to start off. Uh, let's go one by one. So, okay. So, we'll, we'll, start, we'll start here first. Kevin, I'm sorry. We'll start with you. Um, We'll do a few questions, and then uh, and then you can read something, and then hopefully at the end, after we go through everybody, we can have sort of a broader discussion about London, Ontario, um, and its effect on your writing, uh, positive or negative. Um, I don't know why I keep stating things in those binary terms. Maybe it's just the you know past month has been interesting in town, um, and this is the literary festival after all. But uh, but yeah, let's start with you, Kevin. I'm I'm interested in. Uh, how long you've lived in London, Ontario? Uh, why, out of all the cities in the world, you choose to live in London, Ontario, and um, wh whether you know what effect it might have uh, on on the writing that you do? Um, so I've 
lived here in London, Ontario for 27 years. I'm 27 years old. I was born here. Um, um, so there wasn't a whole lot of choice early on, I suppose, but it's <laughs> increasingly become a choice. Um, I think the reason to stick around is just the people, you know? Um, they're just great people here. And um, the literary scene feels vibrant. Um, London punches above its weight, literarily. And um, yeah, I don't know if that covers the questions. It does, <laughs> yeah, definitely. And you do an enormous, Kevin does an enormous amount of work, as, as many of you surely know. Um, I mean, he's a fantastic writer on, on his own, like truly fantastic, but he also uh, is an, an exceptional advocate for literature in, in the city, and you've you know, created or facilitated uh, like a wealth of you know, community events in town too. So, I mean, in your words, kind of what is the, what is the writing community like in London at this time? And you know, so what do, you, what do you see as you know, a person relatively younger than me? Um, what's it like? Because I think that the, the literary scene, so I'm answering my own question, I'm sorry, but the, the literary scene that, that is happening now is probably 10 times better than the one that was going on when I was you know, 27 years old. So, so what, what do your eyes see today? Or what is that community like? Um, you know, there are people in the audience who are directly responsible for the vitality of the literary scene. <coughs> stage. <coughs> this is a stage. Um, I mean, Poetry London has been running for 16 years, Baseline Press for um, 10, 9. Um, um, this has been going for 6. Um, what else? The slam scene is vibrant. Um, the open mic has been going for 6 or 7 years. Um, and it just feels like we're sort of, we're on the crest of something right now. It's a good movie. I noticed the difference in sort of what's happening now. I mean, it, it reminds me a lot of when we were growing up in London, Ontario. I mean, we were sort of younger around the same time, Jenna and Amelia, sort of, you know, causing trouble downtown, you know, breaking into Smuggler's Alley, uh, climbing on the Smuggler's Alley roof, you know, uh, going to see movies at the Capitol Theater they were two dollars and our apartments didn't have air conditioning and it did so you could go see you know armageddon it was a three-hour move it was a three-hour movie yeah. and you had three hours of air conditioning for two dollars that was that was really helpful um there the, the there wasn't sort of there's this punky attitude to what to when we were doing it and it wasn't like drenched in this careerism that a lot of literary scenes have and, and i see that in london ontario now like writers genuinely helping each other out and you know, genuinely building something together without that sort of, you know, uh, how is this going to benefit my career? How is this going to get me to my next book? Not that you know those concerns are never a part of it; they are. But there seems to be an extraordinary amount of goodwill between writers right now in town. Would you say that's fair? Absolutely. Yeah. Do you think that has something to do with like technology? Because when we were younger, like, we were just weirdos hanging out at, like, the Ugly Mug Cafe, like, writing, or, you know, that's just what we did because we were moody, but, like, if you needed to connect with words and, and writing, you had to physically transfer that. Like, you couldn't, like, sending an email was painful, you know? So, do you, like, I would assume that technology, being able to connect words, has created a much more vibrant community of, a more vibrant literary community because you can easily send things back and forth to connect. Because we didn't have that when we were younger. It's possible. I mean, Andy, and Andy Verboom moved out east and I still invite him to things in London, Ontario just to punish him for, <laughs> for doing that. I, I yeah. incessantly invite him to everything. Because like, this is what you've lost. You just invited four times to this. Yeah, exactly. No, I, I invited him to this today. And it's like, you know, he's, he's sipping. And he's probably, like, they're, what, two hours ahead or something? Like, he's, you know, he's probably having lunch right now. But hopefully he's, he's it's a guilty lunch. It's like a sad, guilty lunch. Um, shame lunch. Shame lunch. Yeah, I think a lot, I mean, Western contributes an enormous amount to literacy in London, Ontario. And I think there's a lot of new 
faculty at Western right now too. Like a lot of like, well, Josh is a perfect example. You know, younger, forward-thinking folks at Western who are contributing to the scene in the way that you know James Rainey and you know Ross Woodman did when relatively, um, you know, when 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 they were younger. Is that fair? Do you think? We're we're just opening it up now. Don't worry. We'll we'll, we'll get to reading soon. Oh sure. Uh, I go to Western. Right. And I've been there for three years, which means that I've been in London for three years. And I think I feel very lucky because this literary scene that you guys created when you were growing up here, I got here and it already existed, right? So I'm kind of just getting the fruits of your labor. Um, but yeah, Western is really good for literary arts right now, I think. There's the creative writing program, which is great. But then beyond that, there's like the student paper and there's just a lot of students on campus who really want to write. I think the difficulty is that Western still feels like its own little thing, and then London's its own thing. Like, we're in the same city, but we're also not really, right? Um, yeah, so I, I think it's been cool in the past few years to kind of step outside and be like, oh shit, there's like a whole, a whole other world out there of like this cool stuff happening too. But yeah, I think Western's a really good jumping point for a lot of people. Um, and I think on campus we also benefit from like writers who come to visit and people from London's community but yeah, there's still a gap between Western, I think, and like all this. What what direction does it go? Because I know, you know, back in you know the 1960s and so on, you know, when like James Rainey made um, an active effort to sort of come back. I mean, he was a he's from Stratford, in London, but he sort of, you know, even in his words, made the active effort to like, you know, descend from the ivory tower and mm -hmm. work amongst the people and build that bridge, like. Um, that divide still exists, you know, so many years later. You know, what, what's the most important direction there, do you think? Is it, is it Western coming to London, Ontario, or is, is, is it, you know, us going up there and harassing, <coughs> harassing the university? I think it's a bit of both. I think it's um, students need to recognize that they can, like, go downtown and leave campus. Because the thing about campus that's kind of nice is that there's, like, a hair salon and a grocery store. Like, you never have to leave, really, right? Um, and I think a lot of students just don't because it's like, oh, this is comfortable and we have what we need. <laughs> but then you go downtown and it's like, oh my God, there's like an actual bookstore and there's like all this cool <laughs> stuff. So I, I think it's a matter of like, sure, people from Western and, and London community reaching out to each other, but also just students like getting downtown. I think we're not forced to leave campus enough for that, at least, you know? Yeah. I think on the flip side too, people downtown don't want to go up to Western. Right. Like downtown folk, that the community of downtown likes the community of downtown. And right. you know, like going up to Western to harass students doesn't sound like my idea of fun. <laughs> so I'm not apt to do that. <laughs> um, but I mean, in your work as an advocate, you've, you've You've certainly harassed an enormous amount of you know people in London. Yeah, I'm I'm <laughs> I'm just your neighborhood harasser. <laughs> like, yeah, in my work, I just harass people frequently. Um, so yeah, I don't want to do it any more than I have to. Right, right. Well, I mean, you know, the the it, like like the number the, you know the number thirteen isn't the most comfortable bus to go on. You know, when I think about going to the west, it's like it's like um, um, who was it? Uh, <laughs> not, Bill, not Bill Brady, but Notes from a Small Country. Who's who's read that book? It was Bill um, Bryson. Thank you. Who said that? Too? Yeah, Bill Bryson. Yeah, yeah. He talked about in you know he's an American and he went to Britain and he talked about Britain's ridiculous sense of scale. How you know if you're from this you know tiny village in Britain and you know there's another village like literally two miles down the road. Folks from Britain will just be like, oh, I can't bother doing that. Like, you know, I have to get ready. I have to put my shoes on. I have to get my umbrella. I have to pack a lunch. Like, London has this weird sense of scale where, like, it feels like a deep irritation sometimes to, like, hop on the 13 bus and go up to Western because, you know, that, that, that might as well be Sarnia or something like that, right? Is that fair? Yeah. <laughs> You're like, oh, I got to go to White Oaks. Yeah, I got yeah, White Oaks, right? And if you I don't think really this is a conversation about the LTC. Right. <laughs> <laughs> now we could have a whole trends. panel about yeah. the LTC. Oh, I have lots to say. We don't have enough time to have a conversation <laughs> about the LTC. Um, Schedules, I just go around in circles. 
Yeah. Have you seen that meme about the LTC? I always thought it would actually it would be a great book or scene about some some you know errant you know like rogue writer taking each bus mm -hmm. on the LTC and like writing about their adventures. And you know you do like you know scene number two and it's just the Dundas, <laughs> sort of the the quixotic odyssey of going up to Argyle and. You know, I thought I thought that'd be a great project. You know, with little illustrations. You know, like I stopped off at the Gibraltar Trade Center and like the adventures that you had in there. And got a that giant knife. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Sounds like this is your uh, next project. I think so. It's already no, all I, mapped I, out. Yeah. I think it'd be great. Like you know, like a little section on the Motor Court Hotel. Like I went there and like and you know. Anyway, sorry. <laughs> but Jenna, you 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 grew up in London, Ontario, am I right? Yes, born and raised, old South. Yeah. Um, never intended to stay, but never intended to leave either. I just kind of like, <laughs> just kind of, just kind of, yeah, yeah just kind of hung out. Um, but London's funny. It's like, it's a boomerang town. Like people are like, oh, I hate London. And then they end up back here. So when people are like, London's the worst, I'll be like, see you in three years. Yeah. When yeah. Yeah. You know, when Toronto's too much for you and you're yeah. like, oh, I miss community and people. You know, because London has such a great community and people are like, London's the worst. I'm like, well, you don't know where to look for that community or you don't know how to foster that community. But people are forever being like, peace, London. And then it, they're like, they're back here and then they're, you know, raising kids and doing whatever. And, you know, just admit you like this city. I think we've had this conversation oh, yeah. a lot where yeah. we're like, yeah. man, you like the city, but I think you also make your community too. So... You know, for my writing and stuff like that, mine was my project was just to educate the people in my community. So I guess it was very London informed. Like I want to be able to walk down the street or engage in conversation and not have people be so blindingly ignorant to the issues that Indigenous people have faced and continue to face, especially being in an area that you know, it's just surrounded by indigenous communities. Like, you know, so I, I think it was really, you know, important that people start to think about that. How, so how would you say the, and this might be an unfair question, but how would you say the city has responded to the work? And has that informed the work? Has London's response to your project informed your project? Um, overall, it's been really great. Um, it's interesting, like some folks, you know, you'll say something and there still is that get their back up about stuff. Like there was um, a person in the city who was deciding to do for like Christmas minis and stuff, like little teepees and like all these families being photographed. And I was like, yeah, maybe, maybe you shouldn't do that. And they were totally like super like angry, like teepees, like little drum and like a little fire thing and I'm like this person just lived down the street from me so I was like great now I have to walk past this house every day to go get my kid at school and know that this person is just like whatever I'm gonna make Christmas cards about teepees and drums and like little like Caucasian children in front of them and do, like so you know that's something and and but at the same time that reminds me of the work that needs to be done you know like I'm making zines for folks like that. So, I mean, my response to that issue was they just sent them links to Western's powwow, the students, and I was like, there's going to be so many people here that will tell you how this is wackadoo, like what you're doing. So, please take the time. I'll even buy you lunch. Go down and, and see what, you know, what this is about. Right. right. Amelia, I fear your answer because I know... <laughs> Your, your tumultuous relationship with the city. Um, but please, speak honestly about it. Of course. I yeah. actually really like London. Right. Um, I have a lot of challenges here, culturally, intellectually, but aesthetically, it's, it's improving. Uh, I was in Victoria for a year and a half, which was, you know, I came back, I didn't know, if I came back, I was like, is life going to be terrible when I come back from the most beautiful city in Canada? And it is, and it isn't. <laughs> Um, I've lived here most of my life because historically the rent was affordable, but as not so we, much anymore, right? Yeah, so, we yeah. can't find a place. If anybody's got a place, two bedroom, <laughs> three bedroom, <laughs> under you know fifteen hundred dollars, let me know. 
Um, but I'm writing a book right now called My Life in 13 Cities, and London is in that book. But I kind of wrote the book because um, I've had a rough time living in London. I've, I've not been able to, you know, get to where I want to be in life being in London. However, there's a lot of good things about being here. There's amazing people. There's, like, beautiful parks. And, um, you know, I, I'm happy to be back at the moment. <laughs> that could change. I don't know. What's the chapter on London like? Does it compare to oh the other Oh, my God. Cities? Yeah. It's about shoplifting. <laughs> right. Okay. Because as I had a rough childhood, and I um, found empowerment through crime. <laughs> and, <laughs> and it was really fun, and I got in a lot of trouble. Um, I don't really do it anymore, wink, wink. Um, but yeah, it was a it was a, a chapter very short about the moment that I realized that I was a kleptomaniac. So. Was it a, a B and E variety? You remember B and E variety? That was no, it wasn't B and E. It was, it was, was Zellers. Oh, okay. Yeah. Which Zellers? <laughs> was it North Lane Mall? Mall? Sherwood Forest Mall. Sherwood. Okay. Yeah, I was like looking at the wall, seeing this article. Are you a kleptomaniac? And I'm 17 years old. I'm like, yes, I am. <laughs> And it was a good feeling and also, right. like, <laughs> bad feelings. The poster ironically empowered you to become yeah. a kleptomaniac? Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. I'm not really proud of being a criminal, but I'm just trying to be honest here. Yeah. Oh, that's fine. <laughs> uh, we, we've all probably broken the law one way or another, you know, in yeah. tiny ways. Perhaps statistically speaking, one of us in this room is, has done it in a major way, you know? Um, um, that's just from my wife's research, just the statistics <laughs> of my wife's research. Um, so the chapter on London, Ontario is about stealing. Yes, there may be more than one, but today I have a chapter, a short one to read from San Francisco. <coughs> okay. From one of my leads. Why don't we do some readings? Yeah. Yeah, okay. Amelia, why don't you read your uh, chapter on San Francisco? Okay. Okay, so this is called The Hot Chocolate Buddha of San Francisco. <laughs> it was my last day in San Francisco. I hadn't seen the wharf or ridden the streetcar. There was no time left to eat seafood, having just realized we were on the ocean. I'd spent three nights barely sleeping in a quaint, colorful, low-end boutique hotel, and three days walking the city with a musician and awakened person I met on the internet. My goal was to learn meditation and receive Shakti Pot, a transfer of energy from teacher to student. In the evenings, we sat on large golden cushions in his one-room apartment with his two beautiful cats. It was early, about 9 a.m. I caught a bus up to Haight Street where I hoped to find some small gifts for friends back home. I started at the end where Whole Foods meets Golden Gate Park, and I worked down, walking past the empty early morning, sorry, walking the empty early morning streets that held many shops not yet open. I had breakfast and waited. Up and down Haight Street, dipping into the shops, I found a package of small, laughing plastic Buddhas that did the trick before grabbing the bus back down the hill. There were a handful of passengers, and, the clear, and in the clear San Francisco light, the bus stopped next to a long boulevard. A man pulling a golf bag on wheels boarded, also transporting a very large painting. It was about five by five feet. He lumbered up the stairs with it to the middle of the bus. Setting it down, the passengers took no notice of what for them was a regular event. I, however, observed a man in June wearing a toque with a hot chocolate packet stuck under the flip. His outfit was equally embellished, and his golf clubs on wheels were capped by an upturned wastebasket for security and a few ribbons for flair. <laughs> it may have been my lack of sleep <coughs> or the three days of teaching from my enlightened companion but I recall the man shifting from seat to seat, seemingly engaged in full conversations with passengers all over the bus for the duration of the ride. In my fuzzy memory, I see him appearing at the front, back, and even right next to me, perhaps imparting wisdom or speaking gibberish. I look over to see <coughs> him talking and wondered if the recipient of his dialogue was engaged or not. It was a mystery. The painting was too large to be left unmanned. It shifted back and forth, rocking and nearly hitting somebody. I marveled at the West Coast attitude, a driver who'd allow this piece big as a wall onto his bus. 
The bus lurched and the hot chocolate man grabbed the canvas to steady it. With the front turned my way, I could see the image. Three life-size Buddhas at the bottom, five smaller behind them, 15 smaller behind those and upwards infinitely. It was a remarkable piece. The bus rattled down the hill past the famous television show Full House House, across the street from a park which, in which pastel sweatered picnickers lounged on the green. After a few more rows of pink, purple, and yellow houses went by, my stop came up. I pulled the dinger, back to face my last day with the guru and his two cats. This was four years ago, and I still can't meditate. That's awesome. Jenna, what did you bring to read? Oh, can I go last? I always take it down a notch. You, sh are you sure? Yeah, I always like really like take it down. Like depress everybody. Oh, yeah. That's a good way to go out. Yeah, I mean, like that's what happened at the Urban Lake when I was like, everyone right. has such happy projects. And then there's me. I okay. had to say it. I mean, I can't go, but. I mean, it's up to you. You can go last oh, if you want. Whatever. Okay. Just kidding. Here we go. So um, I'm just going to read this little part from the second zine um, from Introducing Atrocities Against Indigenous Canadians. This one is about um, missing and murdered Indigenous women and girls. And so this was kind of the end when I'm just grappling with a lot of, um, like, with all of this content. So throughout this project, the question, what do I want to come out of all of this work, has been floating in my brain. And it is a question with an answer that is more fluid the deeper I go. There's an internal struggle within Indigenous communities about what direction do we take, what steps will be best, what do we want, what do we need. I don't think there is a singular solution for how to fix a community or how to return the culture many of us have lost. When I was working on issue one, which is about residential schools, I delved into ideas of what reconciliation could be, and I found there to be similar questions because what does reconciliation even look like? It seems possible but these questions overwhelm me because reconciliation looks like so many things and feels like so many things in my mind. I can't say that reconciliation can be achieved with a singular action or approach, but rather we need many actions and many approaches. The steps for Indigenous people to reconciling with the Government of Canada needs to not only be discussed when discussing residential schools, as it is only one atrocity Indigenous people have endured, Indigenous communities need active steps towards reconciliation on all aspects of all issues pertaining to Indigenous pain, trauma, and affairs. When I was planning out this issue, I had sections for causes, current status, and how it connected to ideas of reconciliation in regards to residential schools, and I found that I cannot separate these topics as they are all woven together. What are the causes of hundreds of th and thousands of Indigenous women going missing and being murdered and the powers that be turning their backs? Well, it would be the same causes and ideas that made the powers that be think it was a goddamn good idea to steal children from their parents and place them in government slash church run hell holes. It would be the same causes that gave the government the idea to take nearly 20,000 children away from their families and place them with non-indigenous families during the 50s through to the 80s. And it would be the same causes that let the government think it's perfectly suitable for many First Nations lands to be without safe drinking water. It's the same causes that make the government think putting pipelines cutting through Indigenous lands and water is A-OK -okay because Indigenous people don't matter. Our concerns, our needs, our culture, and our lives do not matter, and therefore, why actually address these issues and listen to what Indigenous communities are saying they need? When hearing these things, most people immediately take the stance of, oh, well, it's not that bad. Or, well, that's ancient history. Or, well, I'm not a part of that, so why are you telling me this? My answer is often as follows. One, it has been that bad, and it is that bad. Indigenous lives being cut short and nothing being done about it is about as bad as it can be. And then you add on everything else, and your it's not bad is just one big hunk of bad. Two, it's not ancient history. The, this answer drives me nuts because people have no idea and y'all walking around with this screwed up narrative of indigenous people and that narrative is usually that indigenous people just can't get over it. We can't get over trauma if trauma is still occurring. Three, did you specifically commit any of these atrocities? Maybe not, but that doesn't mean you can't be informed human who does better by the indigenous people who lived and thrived in this land before you. 
I was recently asked to participate in a discussion um, with some youth regarding indigenous issues, and I was asked if I could think of a call to action for these youth, what would it be? Great group of kids, by the way. I asked them to be informed, to read and know the history of the indigenous people of the land they live on, and while reading, not to feel bad on a personal level. They didn't do this stuff to indigenous people. Many people, when hearing of the horrible atrocities committed against my people, they immediately get their back up in, into a corner and get defensive. <laughs> That's not what this is about. It's not about your guilt. If you didn't do shit, don't take on shit as if you did, you know? What you can do is learn, change the language you use and the narrative where you can, change your negative opinions surrounding the value of indigenous lives and see where you, on a personal and community level, can create spaces where these atrocities are unacceptable and are no longer tolerated. When the truth about indigenous history and lived experience is no longer glossed over and kept out of history books and discussions, then we can say we're taking some real serious steps towards reconciliation. I found myself thinking of when the stories I and others tell won't have to require giving a sad history lesson first in order for others to understand the history that is mixed into the blood that flows through our bodies. When will these stories be more commonly told from pen to paper rather than being spilled out onto the street with violence? Amazing, thank you. I told you. <laughs> uh, it, yeah, it's inciting. It's yeah, not a downer. Um, Gabrielle. Yes, okay. Um, so as I mentioned, I do both journalism and poetry, and journalism doesn't read super well, <laughs> and we're all kind of tired already, so turn to the poetry. It's a little more fun. Um, so I'm going to start off with a piece called A Tree Poem. I cherish the mulberry tree at the end of my street. It's so easy to love the dark stains left behind by its berries, juice spreading like abstract paintings in a murky sky. Those berries, little clusters like pearls, fused together. Their paste, which makes me forget what it is I've been trying to forget. But someone once said that revolution doesn't lend itself to writing about trees. My descriptions of emerald shade Sorry, em emerald leaves and reluctant shade will not convince the few who read this that you and I, with our soft bodies and calloused palms, are worth protecting. In the years that have passed, we've recovered slowly. We go for walks. My girlfriend reads me poems to distract from the headlines, which rise like heat. We stand on our tiptoes at the base of a tree, reaching up to pluck soft, sweet berries. Okay, and next one, can I swear? Yeah. Is that, okay. <laughs> I realize this is being filmed, so I don't know if that's like, I'm, I can be explicit, you know, it's, it's fine. Um, so this is a response poem. I'm responding to an older piece by Margaret Atwood, and it's called Miss July Grows Older, hers. So if any of this sounds familiar, mine too. Um, this response is called Miss October Stays Young. How much longer can I get away with being so fucking cute? A while longer. The dog-shaped mug and the peach-flavored wine can stay for now, along with the sweaters. After a while, you forget about impermanence. When I was younger, I didn't follow politics because I didn't think I had to. Ignorance was a skill. You had to have soft hands and the ability to avert your eyes quickly. It was something I did quite well, like reading tarot cards. No one likes when I pull card 13, death. But some, some endings can't be stopped. Something's got to give, doesn't it? In the backyard, the neighbor's cat stalked a chipmunk he will bring me later. I don't condone this behavior, but Bam doesn't know any better. I wonder what he'll do in a month, when snow covers rotting leaves and fallen walnuts. I wonder the same thing of myself. Meanwhile, the sun sets earlier each day. Meanwhile, I cook split pea soup and drink more tea than usual. Meanwhile, I wake to the sight of frost on green grass. Okay, do I have time to read one more? Yeah. Okay, cool. Uh, so this one, a little, a little bit of context. I'm very afraid of climate change, um, as you know, we all are, hopefully. Um, and my girlfriend, especially, who's, who's there in the audience, is incredibly afraid of climate change. But it kind of comes in waves where she'll be fine, and then suddenly I'll get a text being like, 
what if we live in a boat so that when sea levels rise, we'll just rise with them? You know, and it's like, where did that come from? Um, it's also very wise. It's a very wise it's, response. Yeah, I, it was no context to, she, she was away, she was out of town, I hadn't seen her a few days, and I just got this text being like, what if we bought a boat? And I was like, why, why? <laughs> Um, yeah, so I guess this poem kind of stems from that constant, that constant fear. It's called Postcards from a Coastal Town. Those who scavenge for artifacts in a world still sinking will not think of Atlantis. They will not think that some things are better left unfound. The box at the back of the drawer meant for my eyes and yours. The diary in your nightstand that takes the ridge like a wave, your writing still salvageable. They will not applaud the mystery of letting life stay lost. Years from now, when the oceans swallow up the ground, they will not know what happened here. How we dance in the living room with the curtains drawn, cooked with the heat set too high and charring the edges of our dinner. How we lay in bed well into the morning, letting light flood between the blinds to wash over our bodies. Thank you. Victoria has boats that you can live in, right? Victoria, yeah. BC? Yeah. yeah. There's some lovely boats on the, in, the, in the dock of Victoria. Lovely houseboats. Are you taking notes, Danielle? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I think you need to bring one for the Thames. Yeah. I'll do my best. It might take a while to get around the entire um, continent. But yeah. <laughs> Kevin, what do you have for us? <coughs> All the old thinking is about loss. In this, it resembles all the new thinking. All of language as braille. I don't know what's on the other side of that pine fence, but whatever it is, it is my neighbor. The centuries, like stumps in a storm, conceived nothing. The difference between the glacial weight of a lockjaw solitude and a tender sociability has something to do with steam irons. Crippled Van Goghs begging nickels of shine shoes of the city millipede hustling. The poem is a borrowed fingertip, damp beach. They gave him a hero's welcome, which is to say they said nothing of his inevitable decline like Teflon emptied of sirloins and just the smeared fat beads reminiscing these modern syllables struggle to mean. What privilege it is to now read nothing poems. I go, you stay, two moons. Waiting in line at the supermarket, all this broken beef and all this supermarket line at the beef broken, all this line at the supermarket, this line in the supermarket, all this broken beef waiting. Mm. Finally, this is called Speak to Me. How long away you've walked, my friend, to go six feet. How long, how long away you've walked, my friend. You seem to me to be a walking autumn. Speak to me. You seem to me to be a speaking happenstance I love. And when, in the blent, tense air of our first meeting, in the long dewdrop spinning, in the knot of the foisted cane, in the quiet of piano hammers, in the rain, the correct fury of your why is a mountain. Thank you. So uh, the doors opened up a couple of times with people coming in for I think the next event, which means I think the adults are gonna show us up soon and kick yeah. us out. Um, 
Uh, I do want to, uh, I do have a, a few more things, but I, I, I do want to say I'm very pleased that on our panel today we have done nothing to dissolve the mystery that is London, Ontario. <laughs> it, it, it remains as confusing and elusive as it did when I woke up this morning. So I, I thank you very much. In fact, I think panels like this should contribute to the mystery instead of dissolving the mystery because the mystery is much more fun to live with. Am I right? So uh, before we go off to that good night, um, I was uh, wondering if each of you, uh, if you have projects that you're working on, if there are events that you're a part of that are coming up, you should uh, share them with the audience uh, so they know to be there. And then more importantly, to feel guilty if they are not there, which is, which is how a lot of these events function. Am I right yeah. in our participation at these events? So, uh, so Kevin, what are you what are you working on now in London, Ontario? What is your what are your projects? Um, one thing is, uh, a few weeks ago, I went to the retirement home that my grandmother has moved into and brought a little this little book of poems that she recently published and and uh, and began reading and halfway through the second poem, she's like, "Could you just?" I, she runs downstairs and goes to get a friend of hers who brings food. So um, I read to him for a little while, and I ended up um, um, committing to reading next week at the retirement home with <laughs> amazing <laughs> poets. So yeah, that's the thing that you should feel guilty about. <laughs> You're gonna get so much love and attention there, just like bright biscuits. young man, right? Biscuits. Oh yeah, biscuits. Things and from the purse that you suck on to keep your <laughs> mouth away. Gabrielle. <laughs> Sorry, I have a grandma too. Like I have a grandma. And that is Things a gen from the purse to suck on. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Gabrielle. Yeah. Uh, tell us about the projects you're working on. Yeah. Uh, the, the biggest project I'm working on is graduating. Uh, I'm in fourth year, so I'm just trying to just trying to finish. Um, yeah, I mean, I'm doing the student writer and residence thing, so I have office hours every week. But I don't think anyone in this crowd is like, you can come to my office hours. You don't have to be a student. One thirty to three thirty on Thursdays. Um, there you go. Yeah, but I, I'm mostly I'm working on myself. I'm writing a thesis. I'm trying to graduate, and I will come to whatever events I'm invited to. Um, you can follow me on Twitter to to keep up. But yeah, there's nothing big planned. I'm just trying to. Get to the finish line. Good stuff. Yeah. Aren't we all? Yeah, aren't I think we all so. just trying to get to that. Well, that's the line? thing. It's like I'm almost done, and then I never have to work again. And then it's like, no, then I have to like keep working forever, and then we die. It's all capitalism. Oh, I know. I remember the first day that we like we opened up the bookstore or the first bookstore. I was like, yes, I'm I'm finally free. I get to work for myself. And I just realized that I just enslaved myself to every person <laughs> that walked by my store. I'm like, oh, I, I, work, I work for everybody way, else now. Yeah, right? it's like, this is it. I finish <laughs> this, and then I'm set forever. Right. And then you finish, and it's like, oh, I have like eight more tasks right now. Yeah. Yeah. Reminds me of that Onion article, like, like a uh, cat goes through existential crisis after finally catching a squirrel. <laughs> Remember that one? <laughs> there are always more squirrels. I put a lot of work into Fallout 4 or Fallout 76. It's a fantastic PS4 game, and like I, I, I sunk like over 100 hours in it. And then when it was over, I just felt nothing. <laughs> I felt nothing. Um, Jenna, <laughs> where? Wh when's your when's your next appearance? When will you appear from the ether again in London, Ontario? Uh, tomorrow. Awesome. <laughs> Oh yeah, right. Yeah, you're yeah, here, here, right? Yeah, okay. <laughs> Tell us about that. Uh, so leading zine, a uh, zine workshop. I think it's changing a bit. It was just gonna, I don't know. It was gonna be, you know, helping people make zines and stuff like that. But I think we're just gonna have a big zine off, like a bunch of people coming in making zines. Um, a lot of projects coming down the pipe. You know, doing some writing. Uh, Doing another book chapter for academic book about um, you know oppression and violence within youth and you know yeah just doing as I do more scenes more projects bigger things so yeah but yeah come out tomorrow twelve o'clock there's that guilt <laughs> yeah absolutely yeah guilt in which um, guilt has utility that's the theme of 
Um, and which room in the museum is it in? Is it in down there or is it? Tom? Where, where am I Tom, tomorrow? Where, where are we going to be tomorrow? I think I got moved. Yeah, here. Okay. I think I got moved from right. a smaller room to a bigger room. Right. So somewhere. <laughs> okay. It will happen here. I mean, yeah. Right. Amelia, what's next for you in London, Ontario? Um, well, this is my poetry chapbook that was published by somebody other than me. And I'd like to yeah. exchange. Um, by the way, I, I love it when people do workshops and they actually do something. Like, people actually do something. So I'm hoping that the workshops will not let me down, okay? Because <laughs> I, I want to learn something, but I want to do something, too. Um, so I'm very proud of this because my friend Stuart Ross published this under Proper Tales Press, and he's an amazing person. I don't know if anybody knows who Stuart Ross is. He just won the uh, Fest Harborfront Festival Award, which is a really big deal, and he totally deserves it. So I'm very proud that um, somebody thought my poetry was worth printing. And um, I don't really take my writing or my poetry, any of that stuff too seriously, but I'm just very happy that it has a place in the world somewhere and that it's amusing people at the very least. So yeah, I think that's about all that's, <laughs> that's going on with me. My partner has a book launch, or he had his book launch tomorrow here they're doing a chat with Gary Barwin. My partner's name is Tom Prime, so please check that out. I'm very proud of, of that as well. And that's Tom. That's Tom, Tom Prime, yes. Tom Prime, whose name is very similar to John Prime, a country and western singer. John Prime. Prime's, okay, sorry, all right, see? I but yes, it sounds the same. It's very similar. In, in my mind, those two are, are they, they orbit each other. Yeah. Equally um, talented as well. As you, as no, you, like John Tom's equally Tom. talented. Okay, who's more talented, you or Tom? Oh, me. For sure. Okay, fair enough. But I'm, I'm older. I'm older. You're older. That's right. Yeah. Wiser. That's, yeah. No, not not wiser. Older. <laughs> I like your I like your shout out to like wanting the workshops to be good. I was like, I feel the pressure now. Yeah. Like, no, I know. Are you coming to mine? Like, do I really have to <laughs> amp it up? Like, damn. <laughs> you do have time. You do have time, because we're out of here, and uh, that gives you, what, 25 hours Yeah. to get it together? Yeah, well, I pulled it together from last night. Right. Yeah, so. The most fun for the least effort is the way to live your life. Thank you, everybody, so much for coming. It is. It is. Uh, it, it feels early, but hopefully uh, we've all dreamed together if we're sleeping. Yeah. Dream to share a dream. And uh, tomorrow there'll be London uh, Writers 2. As I said before, the sequel, not as good as London Writers 1. Is it go oh, of course, Jennifer's going to be here. Yeah, of course, sorry. It's a joke. It's a joke. Um, Jennifer will be here on our panel. We're going to have a fantastic panel of people, um, uh, and all four different people. So four different sets of dancers and four different sets of work. <laughs> but uh, yeah, enjoy the festival. Thank you very much to uh, Words. And on behalf of the panel, thank you so much for having us here. And uh, be well, everybody.